would pierce every heart, that they would break through every piece of stony ground to remind us whose we are. We thank you for your daughter, sir. We thank you for surrounding her with protection and with mercy and for bringing her to this place right now. We know, Father, that there's no such thing as coincidence in your kingdom. And so we know that this is a divine appointment, that somebody, maybe me, needs to hear what Valerie's going to share. And so, Father, as the leader of this congregation, I relinquish this situation into my sister's hands and put her in that place of the leader of the things that we will learn at this point. Now we cancel all of the plans of the adversary against everybody here who would stop or try to inhibit what is being said or what they will hear. Give us all ears to hear and a heart to receive what Valerie shares. We ask it in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Yes, You're up. You got the little light on? Um, I think we got a lot. Is that You're good. It? Well, as he said, my name is Valerie. My family calls me Chanel. And some youngsters in my life like to call me Little Val because there's another Valerie in our group. So she gets to be Big Val, and I get to be Little Val. And you're going to hear me say, that's okay. (laughs) I'm vertically challenged. (laughs) So you're probably going to hear me say a few things like Yahuwah. Yahuwah is the Father. Some people call him Yahweh. Some people call him God. I call him either Abba or Yahuwah. And my Savior, your Savior, Mashiach, I call him Yahusha. Some call him Yeshua and some call him Jesus. But we all have the same purpose. We're all seeking after his truth. And I just want to share a little bit about my story. I'm going to try to keep it really short. She said 30 minutes, and I was like, I'm a lady. I love to talk. And especially when it comes to talking about him, I have so much to say. But... I will start by saying I was born in Oklahoma. My dad was in the military, so he traveled all over the place. And so he took me from Arkansas into Oklahoma, and I was born there. And I think like most of us who have come to know him and come to know his truth, it's almost like the enemy had set out for us long before we even knew what to think or how to be a child or how to be an adult. At the very, I feel like at a very young age, he was already there trying to destroy me. I can remember things and remember thinking, why is this happening? But I was talking with my friends this morning, and this morning when I woke up and I had this outline, Abba gave me one of my first memories. And it was, I had this beautiful princess bed with like a white wrought iron and then this little comforter, and I loved it so much. But we were in Germany. We were away from everything we knew, and we were there. So it was my dad and my mom and me. And my mom would come in my room at night, and she would pray with me. And I would pray for everyone that I knew and everyone that I loved. And she would tell me, you'll be safe now. Because after that was when all the bad stuff happened. And that's why she would come pray with me. My dad was a raging alcoholic. He was abusive, very, very violent. And it was crazy because I was daddy's little girl. So to see that man that he would become sometimes at night kind of ripped my heart out. But I knew, I knew I could just pray that prayer and I would be safe. But sometimes I would run out and I would try to hit him. And I would try to go after him for hurting my mom. And so it wasn't very long after that that we ended up moving back to Arkansas. And my dad ended up having an affair and my parents got a divorce. So that is the first traumatic incident that I can really remember that changed everything in my life. The part about my dad being an alcoholic and violent at night was normal to me. I didn't know that there was like normal families who sat down and had dinner and prayed together and ate together. And, you know, I didn't know that that was the norm. I thought what I had was the norm. And so um, when I was six years old, actually I may have been only five, I came in and I caught my dad having an affair and my mom was right behind me. And I just remember thinking like, who is that? You know, who's that person? Mom, like what's happening here? I didn't understand what was happening. And that started the... um, the tearing in my family. My mom went one way, one way, my dad went the other, and they both fought over me and my brother and sister that we had at the time. So it was kind of like, I felt like I was being torn in two different directions. You know, here my dad was, he was still a drunk, and now he's with this woman 
that he had had an affair with my mom with, and that was weird to me. I didn't understand who she was or why she was there. Um, this woman would come become one of the most evil people I've probably ever met in my life. Um, she was very abusive to me and my brothers. Um, she would she would lock us in closets like while my dad was at work. I had a handicapped sister. She would beat her repeatedly when she wouldn't eat or when she wouldn't do the things that she wanted her to do. Um, when she was young, she had a blood vessel burst in her brain, so she's severely handicapped, and she lives in a home. And I just remember thinking, what kind of person could do something like that to somebody else, especially my little sister? But it wasn't long before it got kind of bad. I guess the same thing was happening to her at night that was happening to my mom. When the, when the sun would go down and dad would come home from work, he would start drinking and those things would happen again. So I kind of, I've been able to forgive her because I don't know what she was going through having to deal with that. Because she, she was trying to take care of us and love us the only way she knew how. And then my dad would come home and do that to her. But one day I was, my brother had gotten in trouble. I want to think he got in trouble for me. Like something had happened and I was like, I didn't do it. And he was like, um, I did it, you know. And she took a uh, paddle. It was actually a cutting board, and I remember counting at least 38 licks on my brother, who was probably only about six or seven at the time. And I remember my mom praying with me. I'm like, okay, God, if you're up there, like everyone says you are, if you could just get us out of this mess. Um, it wasn't, it was a few years later, but uh, my dad ended up divorcing her, and I'm kind of summarizing this. This went on for 12 years of my life, all of that from my mom to when I was six and then from six to 12 with my stepmom. And in the middle of that, my mom is nowhere about the time I'm about 10. She just stops coming by. She stops calling. I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Um, nobody told me that my mom was in prison. Um, she ends up doing about nine years of my life. So she's not there for any of this. And I don't know why she doesn't want me. I don't know why she doesn't come or why she doesn't want to spend time with me. I have this crazy stepmom who's abusive and I have a dad who's drunk and I never know what he's gonna do. So I'm just like, what is going on with my life? Um, so shortly after that, my stepmom and my dad get a divorce. He can't stop drinking, he's still hitting her. But now I'm one of six kids um, and she takes her children and she leaves and she leaves me with my dad. And my dad stayed pretty drunk for the first couple of weeks, and then he decided he was going to move us to another town, which is the same town my grandma lived in. He tried keeping us and tried doing the right thing, but it wasn't very long before he, um, one night I came in from school, and he was like, you're better off without me, and this is for your own good. I didn't think anything of it. We went in, we ate dinner, I got my brother in the bath like I always do. And the next thing I know, like, my dad starts going crazy. He's, like, ripping the cabinet doors off the house, shattering the windows. We're renting this trailer. I don't understand what he's doing. And so he goes through, and he's just, like, in this rage of, I've never seen anything like this. I was just like, whoa, what's wrong with dad? He's really, you know, fell off this time. Um, of course, he reeked up alcohol. And when he got done, he yanked the door off, and he was like, I love you, and trust me, one day you'll realize that, that this is for your good. I don't know how that was for my good. I was daddy's little girl. What's he doing? Like, mom doesn't want me. Now dad's talking crazy. What's going on? Well, he left that night. And I waited and waited. I remember that my little brother got hungry. And I don't think we had any electricity in the house that we were living in or gas. But I remember walking down to the gas station. And I had a quarter. And I could get a package of ramen noodles for that. Um, by this time of taking care of myself and my little brother, I learned how to make ramen noodles on a little grill that we had in the backyard. It was one of the little ones with just charcoal. And I remember making him ramen noodles, and he was like, what are we going to do? He was crying. He was upset. I was like, we're going to go to sleep, and when, when Dad gets done doing what he's doing, he'll be back. Um, he never came back, ever. Um, the police showed up at my house, and they asked me if I knew anyone. I was like, I don't, I don't really know anybody, just, just my dad, and um, I don't know where my mom is, and I was like, but my papa's name is Scotty Dar. They were like, does he live here? Yes, he lives here. That's all I didn't know. He lives somewhere in this town. Um, and they called my grandpa, and he came and picked me up. 
And that was the beginning of a little bit of fresh air in my life because at least I had a stable house and I had people who loved me and people that were going to be in my life. Um, but I realized that there was something wrong with me. I didn't really feel comfortable with myself anymore. I felt very unworthy. I felt very alone, even in the midst of school, in the midst of people, or even with my family. And I started going to my grandma's cabinet, and I would get Tylenol PM to go to sleep. I was probably 13 years old, but all I knew was that I could finally rest. I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel alone. And um, that became a habit for me. It started there. Then when I turned 16, I had a knee injury in cheerleading in high school. And the first time I ever took a pain pill, I will never forget the way it felt. It was the most relief I'd ever felt in my life. I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel any hurt. I didn't feel, I didn't feel, actually. I just didn't feel anything. I had kind of been going to church this time with my friends and stuff, but I really wasn't into God. Why would I trust God when I can't even trust my earthly father? He was probably just like him, right? Like, that's what I'm thinking in my head. What's the difference? Like, this is the life you gave me. By now, I know that there's normal people out there, and they have a normal life, and I feel like I got the wrong end, you know? Just, I couldn't trust him. I couldn't trust anybody, really, and that was probably part of my problem. Um, I'm not going to go too far into this, but something very traumatic happened to me um, by my uncle when I was 17, and that was where it really happened for me. I literally just gave up on everything. I turned to drugs. I turned to alcohol. Um, I had become a drug addict at 17. And so I go to college. I meet a boy. I get married. I go and have kids, but I'm still drinking. At night, when I get in and I put the kids to bed, I'm, I'm drinking the bottle. I have become everything that I swear I would never be. I'll never take a drink and be like my dad. I'll never do drugs and be like my mom. But this time she has kind of come home, but she's still not there. She's still out doing drugs, and so I don't really even know what I'm doing. All I know is that now I'm supposed to be a mom, and I'm raising these kids, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, I'm kind of speeding through all this because I want to get to the good part. <laughs> my, my journey has been the best part of it was him. But um, So I get, get married, and I keep drinking, and one day he comes in, and he's like, this isn't working where this isn't going to work. So here I am. I remember when I first got married to Seth, and it's not this Seth, it's another Seth. <laughs> Best friend Seth and ex-husband Seth. Um, I remember crying when I first married him because I was like, you're going to be my husband in, in heaven one day, right? And he was like, no, it won't be like that. And I remember being so in love with him that that broke my heart. I was like, what do you mean? Like, I, I get to go to heaven and all this, but nothing... We're not going to be married. So it was a heart-wrenching moment for me. That was just, it was one thing after another. They, you know, I had this mentality, nobody wants me, I'm not worthy, and I'll never be good enough. So I didn't even understand the point. So I made the hardest decision I've ever made in my life. I know the road that I'm about to go down, and I have to walk away from two of the most precious things I've ever known, my babies. And their names were Parker and Trent, and they were three and one. And I left that day, and I packed up my stuff, and I took everything I had, and I just walked away. That's how you want to be. That's fine. I can't take them with me, though, because I know what I'm about to do. So I left, and I moved to another town, and they stayed with their dad. Um, so this is the part where it's the same thing over and over again. I would um, date different men. I would get drunk, I would get high. I was addicted to methamphetamines. Um, I used it uh, intravenously. I was addicted to pain pills, alcohol, marijuana, and just about anything that would make me numb. Uh, my object in life, because I was kind of chicken, I didn't have enough courage to actually kill myself, but I thought if I could kill myself slowly, then everybody one day would really regret everything that they did to me. You know, I had this poor, pitiful me because of everything that had happened. Um, I probably overdosed four times. I woke up in jail, I don't know how many times. Um, countless, countless times. I would get public intoxications, just minor things at first. 
but it was always the same thing. How can I find in a way, a ways and a means to get more of whatever I'm trying to do so that I can cover up all of this stuff that is happening to me? Um, then I met this guy named Nathan. And when I say that I have been with the devil himself, and I don't know any of you other ladies, if you've met a guy like this, it was that guy. He, he was my father, made over. When the sun would go down, he would start drinking, and he would beat me. Um, many times I would have to tell my mom that I got jumped by multiple people. The last time he did, I had two fractured ribs. Um, he had knocked my jaw out of place. I had 72 contusions on my body. When I got done at the ER, they tried to get me to call the police on him, and I didn't because he loves me, right? This is how you show love. I've seen him my whole life. I know what love is. This is, this is the real deal. He's the guy. Um, we end up getting in trouble. He's involved in some gang activity and stuff, and he comes in one day, and he's like, we got to go. We got to pack up everything we have right now, and we have to leave. And I was like, oh, my gosh, where are we going? He's like, we're going to Texas. What, Texas? What are we going to Texas for? I love Arkansas. You know, we get down here. Long story short, he ends up, he ends up breaking up with me and telling me to go get on a bus and go home. I'm such an idiot. Instead of going and taking the money and getting a bus ticket and go home, I go get a bottle of alcohol because I'm not leaving Texas without my man. Like, that's how ridiculous I am at this point. I'm not going anywhere without him, so I'm just going to go get drunk, you know, until it gets over with. That was probably the best thing that has ever happened to me, and I know that sounds crazy, but you'll find out shortly why. Um, that night I get arrested because I passed out by the pool at the Super 8 Motel in Buffalo, Texas. Um, and in the midst of that, I got taken to the hospital, strapped down to a bed because I was completely belligerent. I took 70 Ativans, I had overdosed, and I drank a pint of Hot Damn 100. If y'all don't know what that is, it's awful. Um, <laughs> even the smell of cinnamon today will turn my stomach. But um, I kicked a police officer in the midst of all that. So now I have an assault charge, an assault on a public servant charge. I was the kind of alcoholic that would drink mouthwash to get drunk or pop a bunch of um, gabapentin or just something, anything to feel any type of buzz because I hated myself that much. I was so uncomfortable with who I was. I needed to be under the influence of something at all times. Or I had, I call it the impending doom feeling. I literally had that pit inside my stomach all the time. I couldn't make it go away. So I get this charge, and um, the police, after they were ready to let me go, because I had started withdrawing from alcohol, so they were going to have to let me out of the jail. Uh, they were like, where do you want to go? I was like, I don't have anywhere to go. They said, well, call your family back home. I called them. They're like, good riddance. Everybody was done with me. I had burnt every single bridge. There was nothing left. And I talked about in my little bio that I kept digging down to the bottom, and then I would just find out there was another one. And it was kind of, ugh. It was a nightmare. I'd be like, oh, this is it. Can't get any worse than this. And that's famous last words a lot of the time. But um, they were like, well, we can take you to Mahaya and drop you off at the Walmart and let you get your prescription filled. Prescription? Okay, that sounds good. Let's just go there. I'll figure the rest out when I get there. And I pull in, and this gentleman pulls up to the police car, and he's a retired police officer in Mahaya. He was like, I know this lady named Valerie. And she has this place called the Life House. I was like, sure, I'll take it, whatever it is. It's a place to sleep. I'm good. And um, so they take me to the police station. So I'm laying here in the police station, nodding off on the medicine that I just got at the Walmart. I was really ready for a change, I can tell. But... Um, and I, Miss Valerie walked in, and it's funny that they call me Little Val because she's about this tall and about 100 pounds, so I really don't know. I was a lot smaller. When I got to the Life House, I was probably about 120 pounds. We're not going to talk about what I am now, but I've ate a lot since then. <laughs> I've really grown up, but um, she walked in, and I'll never forget the look on her face. I'm over there like this on the couch, and she was like, okay. I'm Valerie, you know, I, I'm here to take you with me. Okay, let's go, I'm ready. And I get there and I have this amazing roommate, her name is Tiffany, and she's telling me a little bit about this, this place. You know, we, we honor the Sabbath. And we don't say Jesus, we say Yeshua. And we call God Yahweh. And I was like, well, my, my Savior's name is Jesus, you know. I don't know what you're talking about. We don't do Christmas, we don't do this and whatever. And I was like, okay, so 
this is this is bad. I don't know what these people are talking about. I don't know. I kind of know at this point in my life that Moses parted the Red Sea and that Noah was on the ark and somebody was in a well. Like that's the extent of my Bible knowledge at this point. Maybe what I heard, because uh, all through my life, I'm still just upset with him. And I was really upset with Christians too, a lot, because they had told me, all you got to do is go down there and pray that prayer. Once you go play, not all Christians, just, just in general, you know what I'm saying. Um, go pray that prayer, because when you go pray that prayer, that's it, you're saved. That's it. You, that's all you have to do, just go down and pray that prayer. And I remember going, my friends would invite me to church, and I'd be like, go down there and pray with me, please. Just pray. And I would beg him. I would beg him, take this away. Please, I don't want to drink anymore. I don't want to do drugs. I don't want to sleep around. I don't want to do any of this anymore. And it would last about two days, and then I would be right back to it. No one ever discipled me. No one ever pulled me aside and said, this is how you be a young lady. This is how you walk this out. Until one over there. But I'll get to that in a minute. So here I am at the lighthouse. I'm mad, but these people are talking about God and how He's going to change my whole life. And of course, I rebel because I am just like the children of Israel, constantly complaining. And I just want meat and I just want cucumbers that I left back in Egypt. And I want all of these things. Instead of trying to look and see what it was that he had for me while I was there, I ran back and forth. I would leave and come back and leave and come back. Well, one time I left and I didn't get to come back because I woke up in county jail again. But this time I'm on probation for kicking the cop, right? And they were like, you stole a car, and you got a DWI. I was like, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> that, you got the wrong person. Ma'am, you were the only one in the truck. Uh, no, they made me do it. You know, I had every excuse in the book. And then they took me back to the holding cell, and I realized what was happening. I was like, oh, you're trying to get me like you did Paul. <laughs> This is my moment. Because I had kind of learned a little bit being at the Life House. I would listen. We went to Miss Vicky's and we would go to Shabbat. And um, so I was like, okay, this is that moment. And I remember getting on my knees against my little, my little bed there, metal bed. And I was like, I don't know what you're doing in my life, but I'll tell you what, I'll give you three years. I'll give you three years just like Paul. When he went and studied by himself, or I don't, I tried to look at, I can't remember what the name of that word was, in Arabia, or, oh, you remember? Huh? I thought somebody said it. Um, but I just remembered somebody saying that he, after he was blinded on the road to Damascus, that he went and studied for three years after the point of that. And I was like, okay. So that popped in my head. I was like, okay, I'll give you three years. And I tell you what, I'm going to honor the Sabbath. Like I heard, I'm going to do my best to eat clean because at this point I still really like bacon, and um, I'm going to st- st- honor the Sabbath, eat clean, oh, study the Torah, and I'm going to be abstinent, and I'm going to make, I make this vow to you right now, I didn't know then that I wasn't supposed to make vows, but I did that day, and that was it, I was on my way to prison, I got uh, nine months for the first round for stealing the truck, and I got six years for the assault on a public servant. And I remember the day I got to prison. I thought I'd had some really bad days, but there's nothing like that. Um, I was belittled. I was ridiculed. I was stripped completely down from everything that I have ever had. If you want to know what it's like to be completely uncomfortable, be told 24 hours a day what to do, when to do, and how to do it, don't ever go there because it's just really bad. But uh, I remember them letting us get our stuff after all the bad stuff had happened. We got put in these little cages. There was about 52 women in a cage, maybe about half of this little area right here, with our bags full of our stuff and our mattresses. And we are literally piled on top of each other. We're all scared to death. We are shaking. We are hungry because we haven't eaten because we've been in a holding cell for about eight hours with a bunch of women screaming at us, obscenities. And I saw my Bible sticking up out the top. I've had this Bible for four years, four and a half, maybe almost five. But this one right here is the one that went with me all the way through prison. And so I opened my Bible up, um, Ezekiel 23. And I was just looking for anything. You know, he, to me, this is how he talked to me. I didn't really have a relationship with him yet. But like I said, I'd made that commitment. I was doing those things for about eight months before I actually got to prison. It was 23, 
28 through about 29. Uh, For thus said the Master Yahuwah, See, I'm going to give you into the hand of those whom you hate, into the hand of those from whom you're being turned in disgust. And they shall deal with you in hatred, and they shall take away all that you have worked for, and they shall leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whorings shall be uncovered, and the wickedness of your whorings. I was like, okay, this is it. I've been stripped down of absolutely everything. This is the bottom. What am I going to do about it? So when I first got there, I was like, okay, I'm going to give up TV. What else can I do? I can't, I've already given up anything else. I'm not going to watch any TV because I don't want to do anything to my mind right now. I'm not going to read any books that are not faith-based or of God. I'm not going to do that while I'm here. I'm going to take this seriously, and I'm going to do it. My first parole, I, I go up for my first parole about maybe two weeks after I got there. And I'm like, yeah, there's no way. There's no way it's going to happen. Well, it just so happened around this time we were in part of the half Torah was Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares Yahuwah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yep, I'm not going home. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do? <sighs> There was this program there, and it was called Our Roadway to Freedom. Freedom, that's it. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Um, that's what I want. Put me in that. And so they did. And it was the best thing ever because I was separated from most of the other people in the prison. And all day long, we sat on the, a concrete floor in our all-white uniforms with 58 other women, and we worked on ourselves. Before I left, Miss Vicky had told me, start with the first memory and work your way to now. And that's what I spent that year doing while I was in that program. I worked through every single thing. I can talk about these things that happened to me now without sobbing. Before, I couldn't get through about three sentences. It was my dad, and I would just start crying. Um, So I started working through those things, and I did it with him. I was like, I need your help. I don't know how to heal this. I'm studying the Torah portions. It's starting to click for me. There's more that I should be doing. I'm not supposed to just be... I was waiting for a magic wand. You know, I like the easy way out. I was waiting for him to be like, boom, there you are. And I was like, I'm changed. I'm good. And that that never came. That wand never came because he wanted me to chase after him as much as he had chased after me. He was waiting for me to come to him. And so I joined that program, and I worked really hard. Um, uh, I had to unlearn everything I had been taught. I had to learn that maybe once saved, always saved wasn't what I thought it was. I had to learn that um, I had to walk out my salvation with fear and trembling. I read in Matthew 5 where he said, I did not come to do away with the Torah of the prophets. Wait a minute, what? He didn't come to do away with the law? What law? The law of Moses that I've always heard is done away with? Okay, this is crazy. Matthew 15, 24, I was not sent but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Messiah said to himself, that's who I came for. That's who I was sent for. Okay, I want to be a sheep. I want to be a sheep. That's who I am. That's who I am. John 14, if you love me, you will guard my commands. And then I will send a spirit of truth to you. There's something I have to do to receive that Holy Spirit. Okay, let's do this. Follow my commands. I will give you the spirit. You will be in me and I will be in you. And we will be in him. This is how we do this. this there is something for me to do now. I can see this little outline. Uh, John 15, I'm the vine, you are the branches. I'm a part of him. And if he belongs to the house of, well, Yehuda, Israel, all together, then I should be this too, right? I couldn't find a Baptist gate. I couldn't find a Methodist gate. I couldn't find any other gate in the Bible but one for the 12 tribes of Israel, each one in Revelation 21. Okay, I've heard Miss Vicky say all of those things, and now they're all pounding in my mind. And I'm like, this, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is who I am. I belong to the house of Israel. My forefathers were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I need to be walking as they walk. So this is the reality that's happening to me. Um, I remember one day when I was feeling really sorry for myself, COVID had hit. Um, Also, Floyd Mayweather had died, and we were all trapped in our rooms. So 58 women were trapped in a room for, I think, for about 200 and something days. We didn't get to go out. We had little brown baggy lunches sent in. Everybody was going crazy. There was no phones. There was no communication with our family. And I just remember being scared. 
Um, everybody was reaching for their Bibles, right? In our minds in there, it was the end of the world. I was contemplating how I was going to get out of prison, jump over the walls, and go try to find my children because this is it. This is the end. I read it in Deuteronomy 28. He was talking about plagues. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get to my family. Um, luckily, it, it wasn't as bad. And I did watch a lot of the women begin to turn. And I was so amazing that he used that as... Um, as a way and a means for us to, people like me, to talk to other women. We would share the truth. We would share the word with them. And so I ran into this verse in 1 Peter 8, 418, sorry. It said, yes, no, Peter 8. Um, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall the wicked sinner appear? And when I hear righteous, I think about Hebrews 11, those men, those people who were counted as righteousness because of their actions for him. I'm definitely not righteous. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. Where shall the wicked sinner appear? And what is sin, right? The transgression of the law. So if I'm still breaking this law, that the lawless one has come to tell us that we don't have to do anymore, then apparently I fall under the wicked category because he said that rebellion is as witchcraft. We know that that's wickedness. And I think even somewhere it says anything that's against the word or the Torah is counted as evil. So I wanted to change. And I believe at this point is when I made a wholehearted decision that I would do whatever it takes. I wanted to be like Ruth. And I like to joke around and say, I pulled the Ruth. You are my Elohim. Where you want me to go, I will go. Your people are my people. Where you want me to live, I'll live. I'll live 500 miles away from my children and my family because this is what you want for me to do. I will follow you wherever you tell me to go. And I made that choice. And it was probably another one of those hard ones because I'd read in Mark where it said, if husbands and wives will leave, leave your towns, leave your children, leave whatever, I'll give you a hundredfold in this life and all eternity to come. And I was not ready to accept that verse. And my friends and family will tell you I fight with it every day. My babies who have just now come into my life live that far away. But that was the decision that I made. Um, oh. So I'm coming up on my second parole. And I'm studying through the Torah again. I get to, I guess we're about in Isaiah 45 this time for the half Torah. It seems like Isaiah spoke to me quite a bit. <laughs> I love it. So, um, now some of these verses really don't have anything to do as far as in context, but this was the verses that he used to speak to me. Thus said Yahuwah to his anointed, to Koresh, who right, whose right hand I have strengthened, to subdue the nations before him and ungird the loins of the sovereigns, to open before him the double doors so that the gates are not shut. I go before you and I make the crooked places straight and I shatter the gates of bronze and I cut down the bars of iron. I was like, that's it. I'm out of here, finally. There's big gates, it's all iron, it's all metal. It's, oh, I'm going home. And then I got the letter. Guess what it said? My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. I was like, what is happening here? my family was outside petitioning that I would not make parole. They were going before the parole board and telling them not to grant it to me because I wasn't ready. If I would have known that at the time, I probably would have hated them even more because I still had so much hatred in my heart towards them. I was like, they just abandoned me, nobody wanted me, and they've all turned their backs on me now. It wasn't true. They were doing what was best for me. Even the mother of my children was petitioning the parole board. She's not ready. She's not ready yet. Um, so I got denied again. And for two weeks, I didn't talk to him. I don't even think I really ate. I just laid in my bed and cried. How could you? I heard you loud and clear. You said you were going to set me free. I know what that verse meant. Breaking down those gates, uh, the iron, all of it, the double gates. What are, what's going on? Fine, I'm not talking to you. Uh, it did me a lot of good because then I just felt like that impending doom feeling again for two weeks. And then one night I was in there doing, you know, in prison you wash all your clothes in a sink and you make your food in the sink and everyone uses the sink for everything. So I'm in there washing my clothes and Lord Daigle comes on and it's that, you say I'm love song. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm real loved, you know. I was like, you said you were setting me free. And then it hit me. At that moment I was set free from something way bigger than physically being bound. I was never going to have to suffer as a drug addict again. 
I was never going to have to feel that pain of not having him. I was never going to be alone. I was never going to have to wonder about where I was going to sleep or what I was going to eat. I was never going to have to worry about anything like that ever again. Oh, I just started screaming in the bathroom. Oh, oh, praise y'all. Praise y'all. I am free. This is real. This is way bigger than being released from prison. I'm released from the worst prison I've ever created. And I walk out of there like, guess what? I'm free. I was telling all my friends, like, this is the freedom he was telling me. I knew I was free because I told him, he told me I'm going home. So when they said I wasn't, they were like, well, where's your God now? You know, you know, he said you weren't, you were going to go home and you're not. So then I realized I wasn't there for me anymore. For the next eight months, I spent time talking to women about the truth of his word. And I started asking them those questions that everybody asked me. Where's that at in scripture? Uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to go find it. Uh, three days later, you find that scripture yet? No, I know it's in there, though. I'm going to show it to you because it wasn't in there. So I tried to go to church with the ladies, and then when we get back, I would help show them what I had found in the scriptures. So I wasn't there for me anymore. And then um, lockdown came around, and this is where everybody in prison has to pack up all their stuff, walk a whole mile down the road carrying everything you own, and they get everything searched and looked at, and then you go walk all the way back to your dorm. And by this time, I've been on this unit for two years. I did a total of three. <laughs> He's so funny, right? <laughs> uh, I was just three months shy of three years, but on a Hebrew calendar, that might have been added up just right, huh? <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> He's so funny. I get all the way down there with my stuff, and I didn't make store in prison. While I was there, I did what I had to do. I would wash clothes for people or do things, and then they would help buy me food or buy me toiletries or soap or things like that that I would need so that I could get the things that I wanted. But TDC's something else. If you don't have your name on it, don't have it received for it, you could be in big trouble. Well, I was in big trouble. Um, this was in March, and I remember getting up to that lady, and she was like, you better have your seats. I was like, oh boy, <laughs> everything I have doesn't have a receipt. And it was interesting because she starts singing Have a Holly Jolly Christmas to me while she's throwing all my stuff in the trash. And I was like, Satan, you wicked little devil. I know that's you. And all my friends are like screaming in the background, leave Valerie alone, she don't make store. I was like, it's okay, it's okay. Whatever this is, is happening for a reason. So I just sat there and smiled. And then she got to my Bible. I was like, don't, not that, please. I will do whatever you want. You can have everything I have. Please don't take that because I didn't have my new number. I had my first prison number, but for some reason it slipped up my mind in the midst of all of this to write my new one. And she was like, I'm going to have to put this in the trash. Luckily, one of the guards that had seen me with this Bible for many years was like, don't, don't touch her Bible. Put it back over there. They were like, okay. So she did. She threw away everything I had, but, but my Bible and maybe a couple little pieces of you know, soap or whatever. That's all I needed, though. I didn't care. I got back to the dorm. Before I even got back to the dorm, by my bunk was covered in stuff. I had shorts. I had shirts. I had shower shoes. I had all the toiletries I needed because I didn't mouth off to that lady, even though all my friends were. Like, just wait till you get back to the dorm. I was like, it's okay. And they're like, she doesn't believe in Christmas. So I was like, it's not that. I don't believe in Christmas. <laughs> Be very careful how you word that. I just discovered when his birthday is, and I celebrate that day. But it was just really interesting and weird that they were doing that. Well, two days later, one of my friends, she goes out of the dorm because she works on maintenance, and we're still in lockdown, and she comes back in the dorm, and she stops in front of my bunk. She's like, hey, buddy. I was like, hey. She said, uh, I got some good news for you. I was like, oh, yeah? She was like, you made parole. And I was like, what? <laughs> I got to go home now? My how the table's turned. I don't know if I'm ready to go home yet. <laughs> Uh, are you sure that I'm ready to go home yet? My ways are higher than your ways. Okay. Whew. Luckily, I had a chance to go back to the life house. So I went back there, and of course, in the midst of that, Miss um, Vicky offered me a job over there in Fairfield at Mustang Diesel Repair, and I get to be her office girl there. And I live on site, so I have an amazing opportunity with still the accountability. I've been out of prison for a year and a half now. Um, my mother has been restored to me. She's now walking in truth. Um, my little brother was just awakened the other day. And I was so amazing that he used the Torah to bring me and my ex-husband and his wife and my children together. So this has been a whole year of them celebrating the feast of Yah. 
his. Leviticus 23, speak to the children of Israel. These are my appointed times. Mine, not anyone else's. These are my days. And, um, it started out on a TikTok. I made a TikTok, and I was like, this is it. And I was telling a little bit of truth. And he's like, what do you mean you can't eat pork <laughs> in this country? And I was like, oh, boy. So they set out on a mission to try to find in Torah where maybe those things weren't real. And praise y'all, they're all, they're walking in truth now. Um, it still amazes me because I thought I was just a nobody, right? Nobody wanted me. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. But it, it kind of brings me to Isaiah 40, 1 through 3, I think. No, not Isaiah. We're going to go to um, Psalms. That's what it is. It may be Proverbs. I might have just messed it up. Nope, it's Psalms. Psalms 40. I waited, waited for Yahuwah. I waited so many years for him. So many years to feel complete and to feel whole, like I do today. And he inclined to me and heard my cry, the cries, the years of crying, every tear he captured in his own little bottle that were mine. He saw mine. And he drew me out of the pit of destruction, out of the muddy clay, with his strong right hand. He reached down into that pit and pulled me out, me and you. All of us. He pulled us out of those pits that we had created. And he set my feet upon a rock. And he's establishing my steps. The Torah is a light into my path. It lights the way for me. People hear Torah and they're like, wait, we don't do that. Law. Instructions. If I gave you a book of the love of your life and I told you that everything in it would tell you how to love that person, their wants, their likes, their dislikes, their do's, their don'ts, you would study it like the back of your hand. Well, this is it. The love of your life has given you this beautiful instruction manual, and it is a light into our path. He put a new song in my mouth and praised our Elohim. Many do see and fear it and trust in Yahuwah. So he can take a girl like me with who was going nowhere, really. I didn't really have a chance, I don't think, and I think that's part of being part of his, his, his tribe, his family, is the enemy sets out to destroy you. But like that song is just singing, I sing in triumph today. I'm an overcomer because of his word and what it's done to my life. And so he took a convict, a no good person, and um, now I just get to be his kid. And I have a relationship with him today that is about love and grace and mercy. And I know who I am today, so I have worth. I never did get to see my dad again after that. He died at 52. Um, but everyone else has been restored to me and my family, and uh, it's been a joy to watch them turn to the truth as well. So thank you very much for letting me share my story with you guys. <laughs>